Hello and welcome to the first of this autumn series of UCL Lunch Hour Lectures. This lecture is on sleep, physical activity and cognitive function. My name is Andrew Steptoe and I am a professor of psychology and epidemiology in the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare in the Faculty of uh, Population Health. And I'll be chairing this uh, session today and it's my uh, honor and delight to introduce today's speaker, Michaela Bloomberg. Michaela is a research fellow in the UCL Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare. Uh, she graduated uh, from Cornell University and completed her PhD here at UCL. And her research focuses on the social demographic and lifestyle determinants of cognitive aging and dementia. Um, she's previously worked on sex and gender differences in cognitive and functional aging. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we will have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, and these can be submitted at any point using uh, the Slido uh, format that uh, you will be uh, aware of. Uh, you can enter into this into your slido.do um, into your internet browser and enter the event code, which is cognitive function. So we will have some time to uh, pick up those questions uh, later on in the session. So I'd like now to hand over to Michaela for her talk. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so yes, so thanks very much, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, so as Andrew said, my name is Michaela, and today I'm going to discuss um, physical activity, sleep, cognitive aging, and dementia. Um, so Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are among the leading causes of disability and institutionalization in adults aged 65 and older. And in 2019, an estimated 57 million people worldwide were living with dementia, and this number is actually projected to increase to 152.8 million by 2050. So in general, this increase is due to sort of rapid global population aging, as the biggest risk factor for dementia is advanced age. So as there are more people in the world, as more people in the world live to older ages, we see more cases of dementia. Despite this, dementia incidence is actually generally decreasing. So at the same age, an individual's risk of dementia is less now than it was previously. Um, and this is likely due in large part to increased access to education and better management of particularly cardiovascular conditions, but also some other chronic conditions. Despite the enormous burden posed by dementia on both the individuals with the condition as well as their carers and families, um, research toward an effective treatment is still in progress. Um, so there is currently no broadly approved effective treatment for the, for the cognitive symptoms of dementia. There are some drugs you may have seen in the news uh, that have received recent approval in the US. However, the impact on the cognitive impairment that is seen in dementia is actually relatively minor. So as I've just said, dementia is a major cause of impairments to cognitive function. And generally, when we refer to cognitive function, we mean those abilities that we require to process data in everyday life. So I'll just sort of quickly discuss how we measure cognitive function to examine how cognition changes with aging, including for diagnosis of dementia. So sort of broadly, cognitive function is organized into domains. It's understood that the domains sort of have overlap between them and there are different ways of hierarchically um, conceptualizing them. Um, and major domains include things like concentration and attention, memory, executive function, which refers to those sort of higher tasks of problem solving, critical thinking, um, language skills, processing speed, motor skills, all the way sort of down the hierarchy of complexity to basic sensation and perception, which require considerably less coordination of other domains, whereas executive function requires the coordination of many domains. So we use different cognitive tests to assess these various domains, once again, with the understanding that the tests of more complex areas um, require the coordination of multiple cognitive domains. 
So a decline with, um, in cognitive scores with age is normal. Um, there are some cognitive domains that show, do not show as much decline as others in normal cognitive aging. Things like, for example, semantic memory, uh, this refers to long-term storage of verbal information, seems to remain mostly intact over the life course. Other things like vocabulary also tend to remain intact. Um, executive function can be less affected by aging. However, some of the component processes of executive function, like processing speed and other memory subdomains, actually decrease with age. Um, and in neurodegenerative conditions like dementia, we see um, an exacerbation of the severity of the cognitive decline. So cognitive decline occurring faster than we'd expect. And once a certain threshold of cognitive performance is reached, and this is sometimes operationalized as one to 1.5 standard deviations below the mean performance for that age group, then an individual is considered to be cognitively impaired. And this cognitive impairment is one of the major components of the dementia diagnosis. So dementia is a syndrome, um, so it's a collection of symptoms. Um, and as I said in the last slide, one of the major symptoms of dementia is cognitive impairment. However, that cognitive impairment must be severe enough to impact daily life activities. Um, and that's when you might be evaluated for dementia when both of those criteria are met. Uh, the diagnosis might also include um, a CT scan or MRI to determine the underlying pathology as or cause as dementia can be caused by a number of different pathologies. So Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common cause of dementia. Um, it is characterized by this abnormal deposition of beta amyloid and tau proteins, which leads to death, death of neurons and then the cognitive symptoms that we observe. Um, so Alzheimer's pathology is present in 50 to 75 percent of dementias, though many dementias may be sort of primarily one pathology with a mix of others present as well. Vascular dementia is the second most common um, cause of dementia. It's characterized by damage to the uh, small blood vessels in the brain. Um, it's often challenging in large scale population health studies to ascertain data about specific dementia pathology, um, especially when many dementias are caused by a mix of pathologies. And we often rely on self-reported dementia diagnosis or records that do not specify the cause of the dementia. Um, so for this reason, in general, uh, large studies investigating dementia include uh, the dementias that are caused by these first four pathologies um, without distinguishing between them and sort of using this broad umbrella term dementia. And as I've said previously, because there is no broadly accepted treatment for dementia, there is a lot of research that focuses on prevention or identifying those factors that might delay the onset of clinical symptoms. Um, this plot that I've shown here is from the 2020 Livingston Lancet Report on Dementia. Um, it shows the risk factors for dementia and approximately the percentage decrease in prevalence of dementia if a given risk factor were eliminated from the population. So for example, um, hearing loss is a midlife risk factor for dementia, um, if there were no hearing loss at all, we'd expect the number of dementia cases to decrease by 8%. So the key early life risk factor here is education. Um, and education is thought to increase peak cognitive performance during midlife and thus serve as a buffer to later life neurodegeneration. Other risk factors include occurring during midlife include things like hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, alcohol use, and obesity. And then later in life, we have smoking, depression, social isolation, physical activity, air pollution, and diabetes. So this means that in total, an estimated 40% of dementia cases are attributable to modifiable risk factors. And many of these risk factors occur during midlife and early old age, so potentially many years before the onset of the dementia diagnosis. However, one of the most challenging aspects of research in dementia is the long preclinical period. And the preclinical period refers to a stage of disease where we see biomarker changes, but not yet observable cognitive symptoms. So in this plot, um, cognitive performance is changing as a function of age. So as age increases, cognitive performance decreases. It's not necessarily linearly as is shown here, um, but sort of for demonstrative purposes, we'll simplify it and say that it is. Um, in this individual, cognitive performance decreases to the extent that it crosses the threshold of cognitive impairment, which might warrant evaluation for dementia. And that threshold is indicated by this uh, red dashed line. However, while cognitive performance is decreasing, neuropathology is building up. 
So before we see appreciable decreases in cognitive performance, before that individual reaches the threshold for cognitive impairment, where they might be evaluated for dementia and Alzheimer's disease, for example, beta amyloid and tau are accumulating in the brain. So this means that by the time the diagnosis occurs, there have already been a lot of pathological changes in the brain, and pathology has been building up probably for decades before an individual is even evaluated. So this stage is called the preclinical period of dementia um, and has been observed, for example, in Alzheimer's disease to occur between 2 and 15 years before the dementia diagnosis occurs. Um, so if you think back to our modifiable risk factors for dementia, for some of these late life and even the midlife risk factors, if an individual is going to get dementia, the pathology is probably already present when we measure the risk factor. So instead of examining the effect of a risk factor on dementia, what we're actually examining is the effect of preclinical dementia, where already we start to observe cognitive decline that is steeper than normal for cognitive aging on the risk factor itself. Um, so in the example of sleep, which will, is one of the focuses of this presentation, we might surmise that poor sleep causes dementia. What we may actually be seeing is that the early dementia, before it's clinically detectable, causes bad sleep quality. Um, so for this reason, it's necessary to observe risk factors many years before the onset of the diagnosis to be sure we're catching individuals before the early dementia symptoms have set in. And when we examine a midlife risk factor for a late life cognitive outcome like dementia, what we really are interested in is in doing is changing the overall shape of the cognitive trajectory, because by the time the diagnosis occurs, or even a couple of years before the diagnosis occurs, it's really too late to intervene, um, and the pathology has already been building up for years. So this is why the focus of a large part of the research around cognitive aging and dementia, including my own work, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail later on, um, is about cognitive aging rather than dementia. And so there are two ways targeting sort of a midlife determinant of cognitive performance can influence the cognitive trajectory and dementia risk. So here an individual's cognitive trajectory is shown in blue. Um, right now they reach this threshold of cognitive impairment after some age. This doesn't necessarily mean that they'll go on to develop dementia, but their cognitive function is impaired compared to their age match peers and may continue to deteriorate. So if we target some midlife risk factor, we can either improve cognitive performance during midlife. Uh, so this makes it so that an, the individual is declining from a higher starting point, um, and therefore the age at which cognitive function starts to impair well-being, or in the case of dementia, onset of clinical symptoms, occurs later. Um, we can also reduce the rate of cognitive decline. Um, this also has the effect of delaying the onset of cognitive impairment. So we can see that by impacting cognitive function during midlife, we can change the late life trajectory of cognitive aging. And that might occur regardless of whether the individual is experiencing sort of pathological decline, so decline due to disease or not. So for people who are experiencing normal cognitive aging, it means better cognitive function, more autonomy, more participation in meaningful activities to an older age. Um, for people experiencing pathological cognitive decline, it potentially delays the age and onset of clinical symptoms. Um, so all of this is to say why we might focus on risk factors that influence the shape of the cognitive aging trajectory rather than focusing on dementia. Uh, so we want to change that entire shape of the cognitive aging trajectory to delay symptoms. And to do that, we have to understand what shapes how cognitive function changes over time. And not just that, but how those factors interact with each other to shape cognitive function. Um, so now we get to the focus of this presentation, which is physical activity and sleep. Um, these are two behavioral factors that are thought to be important contributors to cognitive function. So as you may know, sleep occurs in four stages, N1, N2, N3, and REM. Um, stages N1 to N3 are considered the non-rapid uh, eye movement stages, or NREM. Um, with each state and each of these stages is a progressively deeper sleep. In REM sleep, however, the brain becomes more active. This is when we dream um, and we cycle through these stages around every 80 to 100 minutes. And there are different ways to measure sleep in studies where we're examining sleep and cognitive function. Um, so we can use accelerometer based measures. These can be either wrist worn, for example, like a fist Fitbit or Apple Watch or Garmin or hip or thigh worn. Um, and we can use these to produce data about how individuals spend sleeping or doing physical activity. So sleep and physical activity both fall under this uh, category of uh, 24 hour movement behaviors. So an individual's 24 hours are broken down into the amount of time they spend sleeping, physical activity and in sedentary behavior. 
Um, so this plot here shows eight days of accelerometer use and an individual, the date is on the left and the time of day is on the top axis. Um, and then we use machine learning methods to extract the time spent in sleep, sedentary behavior, light and moderate and vigorous phys physical activity um, to produce a plot like this one, uh, which shows this person's sort of activity patterns over the eight day period. So from this, we can see things like sleep disturbances and total time spent sleeping. However, other more detailed aspects of sleep quality, like information about time spent in each stage, each sleep stage is not really possible to ascertain with the methods that we have currently. For greater detail, some studies also use polysomnographic methods, which use EEG and other sensors to detect um, brain waves and movement throughout the night. Um, so as you can imagine, or perhaps you might have experienced if you've participated in laboratory-based sleep studies or else been evaluated for a sleep disorder, um, this is quite invasive by comparison to accelerometers, um, and it's also quite expensive for, for use in studies. Um, so in general, you tend to see sample sizes in the tens to hundreds when they use polysomnography, whereas accelerometer can be used in larger studies. Um, however, the level of detail that you can ascertain from polysomnography is obviously much higher. Um, you can glean information about time spent in each sleep stage. Um, and furthermore, accelerometers have this issue of being unable to distinguish between sleep and sedentary behavior. So they're really best used in combination with a sleep diary. The perhaps sort of easiest and most straightforward way to measure sleep quality in a large study population is to use subjective assessment, usually just a questionnaire in which participants are able to report information about their sleep habits. Um, so this one shown here is uh, very commonly used. It's called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, um, and it evaluates sleep in several domains, um, including subjective sleep quality, sleep latency, sleep duration, habitual sleep efficiency, and sleep disturbances. So when we refer to sleep quality, we can be referring either to objectively or subjectively deme measured dimensions of sleep quality. Um, there is some overlap between objective and subjective measures, though, of course, objective measures will measure the actual behavior, whereas subjective measures measure perception of behavior. So aspects of sleep like sleep latency, um, this refers to how long it takes a person to fall asleep after they're in bed, um, sleep duration and sleep efficiency, which refers to how much of the time spent in bed is the person actually asleep, can be assessed using either method. Um, other aspects of sleep, like disturbances, can be assessed objectively by examining, for example, how much time after the onset of sleep individuals spend awake or moving, or subjectively just by asking individuals if they experience sleep disturbances. Um, other measures, like time spent in each sleep stage, are limited to objective measures and specifically polysomnographic methods. Likewise, obviously, subjective sleep quality can only be assessed subjectively. So to move away to, from the measurement of sleep and into sleep and cognitive function, um, it is well known that sleep quality has myriad impacts on short-term cognitive function. The mechanisms are actually not particularly well understood. Um, there's some thoughts about um, it, it impacting beta amyloid. Um, I think we've sort of all experienced um, getting poor night's sleep and then having a tough day at work the following day. Um, in the short term, poor sleep quality has been associated with impaired memory, um, impaired attention, and psychomotor performance. Um, and there was actually a meta-analysis of 72 studies which examined associations between objectively assessed sleep and cognitive performance. So that was both accelerometer-based and polysomnographic studies. And it included over 15,000 participants um, and found that the aspects of sleep associated with better cognitive performance included things like less restlessness, uh, shorter sleep onset latency, more time spent in REM sleep, and in non-REM sleep stage two sleep. However, sleep is also implicated in long-term cognitive function. Um, so the most commonly examined metric of sleep quality here is sleep duration. Um, that's because it's sort of um, e relatively easy to report with some ac accuracy based on questionnaire and can also be assessed using accelerometers relatively straightforwardly. Um, so for example, um, so this is an examination of 20,000 adults aged 50 years and older um, from studies from England and China. They were followed up over 10 years to see how their cognitive function changed during that period. Um, and more decline in the global cognitive function was seen for those at both extreme ends of the sleep spectrum. So both those who slept both uh, very long and very short, um, with the optimal time being around seven hours. So in this plot here, the x-axis is the sleep duration, uh, the y-axis is decline in um, cognitive score per year. Um, and we can see that the short sleepers and long sleepers experience more decline, whereas those sleeping sort of six to eight hours per night, there was relatively minimal cognitive decline. 
So we also see a similar trend for risk of dementia. Um, so in this plot, um, the um, uh, uh, in this plot, uh, the y-axis, a higher value on the y-axis indicates a higher risk of dementia. Um, and the sleep duration is once again on the x-axis. Um, so we can see here in that particular, that short sleep uh, during midlife was associated with increased risk of dementia. The association between sleep and cognitive dysfunction in dementia is actually bidirectional. So sleep disturbances are a common early symptom of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. We also see sort of more profound circadian rhythm dysregulation in later, at later stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then the sleep disturbances may then feed back to worsen the cognitive symptoms that we see. Um, so this complicates examination of the long-term cognitive effects of sleep. So now to move on to physical activity. Um, generally, physical activity refers to any bodily movement that requires energy expenditure, so even habitual movement, moving around, um, while exercise is a structured subset of physical activity that's focused on improvement or maintenance of physical fitness. And just like sleep, physical activity can be measured objectively. Um, generally, here we use accelerometers, or it can be measured subjectively by questionnaire. And like sleep, there's certainly evidence of shorter term associations with better cognitive performance. Um, so there was one meta-analysis of intervention studies, so sort of that gold standard for causation, found that at least 45 to 69 minutes of um, moderate intensity exercise was associated with benefits to cognitive performance, and that occurred regardless of the cognitive domain that was examined. So it was across all cognitive domains. However, the results for sort of habitual physical activity and cognitive decline in dementia are a little bit more mixed. So there is, there are some meta-analyses. There's one from 2011 that found that um, physical activity was protective against cognitive decline um, and was associated with decreased risk of dementia. Um, but there is some evidence that these studies may be affected by the impact of early dementia symptoms on physical activity. So uh, this is a 2017 study, um, and it found that eight to 12 years before dementia diagnosis, uh, physical activity trajectories actually diverge between cognitively healthy participants and those with dementia. Um, so here the uh, total uh, physical activity hours is shown on the y-axis or the mild physical activity or moderate and vigorous physical activity. Um, the x-axis is the time to dementia diagnosis for those who went on to develop dementia or um, end of follow-up for those who are dementia-free. Uh, the dementia-free, um, uh, individuals are shown, their trajectory um, is shown in uh, blue, and the dementia cases are shown in red. Um, so this would, and we can see that during this eight to 12 year period before the dementia diagnosis, um, we see these trajectories start to diverge. So this would suggest that perhaps um, the associations between physical activity and cognitive decline that we previously observed are due to the effects of preclinical dementia on physical activity levels rather than the other way around. So while physical activity and sleep are likely to be independently associated with cognitive performance, um, they're also interrelated. Um, so light is the primary trigger of circadian rhythms, um, but it's thought that physical activity may also play a role in circadian rhythm regulation. And there is some experimental evidence that suggests that more physical activity performed during the day results in better subjectively and objectively assessed sleep quality. Because of their interrelated nature, it is very important to understand how these two behaviors interact to shape cognitive aging trajectories. And indeed, there was uh, recently a very comprehensive review of literature examining interactions between sleep and physical activity, which suggested that more time spent in moderate and vigorous physical activity might reduce the impact of suboptimal sleep duration on cognitive function or vice versa. So to summarize, um, the bulk of the evidence does point to some role of sleep and physical activity in cognitive performance. Um, it suggests that engaging in regular physical activity probably provides a short-term boost to your cognitive performance at the very least, um, while getting enough sleep may also influence the rate of cognitive decline and dementia risk. Um, and also that physical activity levels impact your sleep and vice versa. There is also some evidence um, that sufficient physical activity might reduce the cognitive impacts of suboptimal sleep. However, these studies are primarily cross-sectional. So this is an issue because in cross-sectional studies where we're just assessing sleep, physical, acti and physical activity, and cognitive function at a single point in time, um, we're not sure if we're seeing the effect of physical activity and sleep on cognitive, cognitive function or the impacts of cognitive dysfunction on sleep and physical activity behaviors. 
Secondly, they're relatively small, um, meaning just a couple of thousand participants at most. Um, so this is an issue because when we start to want to look at combinations of characteristics, so in this case, sleep and physical activity, we really need large sample sizes to be able to yield precise results. So with these limitations in mind, um, our, the, our study, um, in our study, we ought to um, examine the joint associations of self-reported physical activity and sleep duration with 10-year cognitive aging trajectories in a large-scale and cognitively healthy study population. So to do this study, we use the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, or ELSA. This is a nationally representative study of the English population aged 50 years and above. Um, it was recruited from the Health Survey for England in years between 1998 and 2001. So the first wave of these interviews occurred in 2002. Uh, since then, there have been eight other waves bringing us up to 2018. Um, and data collection for wave 10 began in 2021, uh, is mostly completed in 2023 with some data processing ongoing. So for the present study, we use the 2008 wave as the baseline wave, um, because this is the first wave where participants were asked about sleep duration, while questions about physical activity were available at all waves. Um, so our study population for this analysis was 8,958 cognitively healthy adults age 50 and above. So we did exclude those um, with cognitive scores, um, suggesting cognitive impairment or dementia in order to reduce the impact of early dementia symptoms on sleep and physical activity. So here for this study, respondents were asked how often they participated in light, moderate, or vigorous physical activity, um, and they were given examples of each category. So light physical activity includes things like slow walking or cooking or washing the dishes. Um, moderate activity includes very brisk walking, heavy cleaning, things like vacuuming or mopping, um, light bicycling or tennis. Uh, vigorous physical activity includes activities like strenuous hiking, jogging at a brisk pace, uh, shoveling snow, carrying heavy loads, or fast cycling, things like that. Um, we then use the answers to these questions to produce a um, summary physical activity score. And this was weighted to take into account both the frequency and the intensity of the activities that were performed. So upon examining the sort of physical activity characteristics in each category, we further dichotomize the physical activity score into these low and high PA categories. So the high PA category corresponds to the top tertile of summary physical activity scores and the low PA category to the bottom two tertiles of summary PA scores. So this really roughly corresponds to those performing weekly vigorous physical activity compared with those who didn't. However, by using a physical activity score, we could take into account the other physical activity intensity levels um, rather than sort of adjusting for and disregarding them in subsequent analyses. Um, sleep duration was also assessed at the baseline of our study. Um, here, participants were asked how many hours they slept on the average weeknight. Um, short sleep duration corresponded to less than six hours of sleep per night. Optimal sleep duration, um, six to eight hours of sleep per night, and long sleep duration, greater than eight hours of sleep per night. Um, so these cutoff points were chosen in line with the previous evidence that was observed, we, we observed for um, associations between subjectively assessed uh, sleep duration and cognitive performance. So cognitive function was assessed at ways four through nine. Um, this corresponded to 10 years of follow-up, so we were able to construct these cognitive trajectories over the 10-year period. Um, and cognitive function was assessed in two cognitive domains. Um, epi firstly, episodic memory. Episodic memory was assessed using immediate and delayed recall tasks. Uh, this is where participants are read a list of 10 words and then asked to recall it immediately and then after a short delay. These scores are then summed to yield a summary recall score. The other um, cognitive domain that we examined was verbal fluency. Um, this was examined using the animal naming task where participants are asked to name as many animals as possible within a one minute period. We standardized the scores to the cohort at baseline and we took the mean of these two um, scores um, to produce a composite cognitive score. And we did this after examining the results separately in each cognitive domain and determining that they were similar. 
Uh, so we use linear mixed models. This is a common method that is used for longitudinal studies um, to first examine the independent associations of sleep and physical activity with cognitive performance and cognitive decline over the 10 year follow-up period. Um, so here we were primarily interested in seeing how cognitive trajectories differed between physical activity groups and between sleep groups, but looking at the two, um, two factors separately. However, the main interest of our study was the joint associations of sleep and physical activity with cognitive performance and decline. So we wanted to examine how cognitive trajectories differed between individuals with different combinations of physical activity habits and sleep duration. And we adjusted these models for age at baseline, uh, for sex, marital status, education, wealth, smoking status, alcohol consumption, BMI, chronic conditions, and depressive symptoms. So I'll just start off with some sample characteristics. Um, in general, the distribution of sleep duration was very similar between the physical activity groups. So they slept a similar amount of time regardless of physical activity level. The one exception here was short sleep uh, where participants in the high physical activity group were much more likely than those in the low physical activity group to report short sleep. So we first examined uh, the independent associations between physical activity and the 10-year cognitive trajectory. Um, so this plot shows the 10-year cognitive trajectory, cognitive trajectory in the high physical activity group in blue and the low physical activity group in green. Um, the x-axis here is a time since baseline in years and the y-axis is the standardized cognitive score. So as we can see, um, we found that in the high physical activity group, um, there was better cognitive performance than the low physical activity group at baseline. However, we can see that these trajectories are parallel. Um, so there was no difference in cognitive decline between the high physical activity and low physical activity groups. So this plot now shows something very similar, the 10-year cognitive trajectory in the different sleep duration groups, once again with time as the x-axis, time since baseline as the x-axis and the y-axis as the standardized cognitive score. Here now the short sleep group is the dashed line, the dotted line is the long sleep group and the optimal sleep group is the solid line. Um, so we found that um, optimal sleepers had better cognitive performance at baseline than both the short and long sleepers. And short sleepers also declined slightly faster over the 10 year period um, than um, the optimal sleep group. Um, however, there was no difference in cognitive decline between the long and optimal sleep groups. So now here we've constructed the 10-year cognitive trajectories for each combination of physical activity or PA and sleep duration. So here we've now allowed the cognitive trajectories to differ depending on the age at baseline. So as you can imagine, a cognitive trajectory over 10 years is a different shape depending on whether you're 50 at the baseline of the of, the present, of our study or 70 at the baseline of our study. Um, so in the previous plots, we examined the average cognitive trajectory across all included age groups, but in, now we look at the cognitive trajectories from several ages. So on the left is the 10-year cognitive trajectory when participants were age 50 at baseline. Uh, the uh, center is age 60 at baseline. You can see the cognitive decline is a little bit steeper. And then finally at age 70, the cognitive decline is steepest. Um, so he, as previously, the physical activity groups are indicated by the colors. So blue is high, green is low, um, the, and the sleep duration um, is the same as well. The dashed line is short sleep, solid line optimal, and dotted line long. So if we focus on the cognitive performance at baseline, or at time zero, um, we see that in general, um, the high PA groups outperform the low PA groups, and that occurred um, regardless of sleep quality at baseline. There's a little bit of variation by age there, but for the most part, um, that was a consistent observation. However, we're also interested in how the cognitive function changed during the 10-year follow-up period um, in the different PA and sleep groups. Um, and indeed, we saw that um, in the high PA short sleepers, uh, the high PA short sleepers decline faster than all the optimal sleep groups at the younger but not the older ages. So here the cognitive trajectory of the high PA short sleep group is shown in red, the optimal sleep group in black. Um, we see that from baseline ages fifth, age 50, the high PA short sleep group declines much faster than the optimal sleep groups. This is slightly less of the case at age 60 and these slopes are approximately the same at age 70. So the result of this is that for younger ages, though the high PA optimal sleep group performs similarly to the high PA short sleep group at baseline, 
At the end of the 10 year follow-up period, the high, uh, the high PA and short sleeper scores were actually almost the same as the low PA short sleeper scores. So despite regularly participating in high intensity physical activity with short sleep, these participants still experienced more rapid cognitive decline. And we saw that this was true when individuals were a bit younger at baseline. However, if participants were older at baseline, the cognitive advantage associated with higher physical activity remained for the entire follow-up period. So we can see that here, um, all of the high physical activity groups perform better than all the low physical activity groups during the 10-year follow-up period, regardless of sleep quality. So there's several conclusions to draw from this. Um, for the independent associations, we found that um, more frequent and higher intensity physical activity was independently associated with better cognitive performance at baseline, but was not associated with the rate of cognitive decline. Optimal sleep duration was also associated with better baseline cognitive performance compared to short and long sleep duration. And additionally, short sleep duration was associated with faster cognitive decline. Um, and from the examination of the joint associations of physical activity and sleep, we found that um, though there was a baseline cognitive benefit associated with more intense and higher frequency physical activity for all sleep groups, whether that benefit persisted during the 10-year follow-up period depended on age and sleep habits. So for those who are middle or in early old age at baseline and reported high physical activity and short sleep, we observed this rapid cognitive decline so that by the end of the follow-up period, their cognitive scores were commensurate with those in the low physical activity categories. By contrast, the cognitive benefit associated with high physical activity was maintained over the follow-up period for the older participants at baseline. Now, um, there are a lot of reasons we could have seen this result for younger, but, or for younger middle, middle age and younger old age, but not older adults. Um, so we could be seeing this issue of sort of cognitive dysfunction impacting physical activity and sleep behavior, though the fact that we did exclude the cognitively impaired um, individuals slightly reduces this possibility. Um, other reasons include that physical activity may be more important than sleep duration for older adults. So if you're meeting that very, really rather high cutoff for physical activity into your 60s and 70s and beyond, you're probably very healthy regardless of sleep habits, and perhaps this is translated to better cognitive function. It's possible that older adults less accurately report their total sleep time, and this may be because um, sleep as we get older tends to include more fragmentation, getting up during the night. It could be that older adults sleep less naturally. Indeed, um, as we get older, we do require a little bit less sleep. Um, and this doesn't necessarily correspond to cognitive deficits, uh, whereas long sleep in older adults is indicative of less efficient sleep and more frailty or other conditions requiring more sleep. So it may just be that we sort of need to shift that optimal sleep duration down a little bit for older adults. And this could mean that sleep duration alone is too coarse of a measure to capture sleep quality for older adults. So as sleep starts to include more and more fragmentation or daytime napping, um, maybe we need to capture other aspects of sleep quality. Um, in reality, it's probably a combination of many of these things and really will require further study. And accordingly, there are limitations to the study, which uh, do pose directions for future research. First and most obviously, we use subjectively rather than objectively assessed measures of sleep and physical activity. Um, so these self-reported measures are associated with numerous health outcomes, including dementia, as we've seen, suggesting they likely do have clinical importance. But it will be interesting to see whether we get a similar result when we use objective measures. Um, so when we're measuring people's actual behavior as opposed to their perceptions of their behavior. Um, secondly, we examined two cognitive domains in this study. Um, so these two cognitive domains do show decline with aging and with dementia. Um, so they are well suited to sort of capture this cognitive aging process. However, it will be interesting to see whether these results translate to other cognitive domains, particularly things like executive function, which require coordination of a lot of other uh, cognitive domains. Um, we also have a cognitively healthy sample here, um, and that is done on purpose uh, to um, to reduce sort of the uh, bi-directional association between sleep, physical activity, and cognitive function. So it will be interesting to see if we see similar results in a population that is experiencing pathological cognitive decline rather than 
who is primarily experiencing healthy cognitive aging. Um, because it's entirely possible in a, in a population that's experiencing pathological decline, these relationships will look different. Um, and it will also be interesting to look at dementia as a primary outcome, but once again, as we've seen, that will require uh, many, many years of follow-up and sufficient dementia cases to look at, um, look at sleep and physical activity with precision. Finally, the study population of ELSA is 95% white. Um, this does reflect the demographics of over 50s in England in 2002 because it is a population representative study. So it will be necessary to replicate this finding in more diverse cohorts from other countries um, and examine sort of ra potential racial and ethnic variation in the results that we see. Um, there is some evidence that suggests that um, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups may need more physical activity to see the same cognitive benefits. Um, but this certainly requires much, a lot of further study. So finally, to um, hit some key takeaways from our study, um, the long-term cognitive benefits of physical activity may be reduced if they're not supported by sufficient sleep. And so the WHO publishes this large document summarizing its recommendations for modifiable risk factors for cognitive decline and dementia. Um, and physical activity is included as a key target for maintenance of cognitive health. However, um, interventions should consider also integrating sleep habits into those interventions in order to maximize the benefits of long-term cognitive health because sleep and physical activity are intrinsically related behaviors and it is challenging to look at one without also considering the other. Um, so I just want to finish off my presentation by thanking my co-authors, uh, Laura Brocklebank, Mark Hamer, and Andrew Steptoe, um, mentioning our funders. Um, so this paper is actually available to read in the Lancet Healthy Longevity, and we also spoke to the Lancet podcast as well, which can be seen in that QR code. Um, so thanks very much for your time and attention, um, and I look forward to some questions. Well, thank you very much, Michaela, for a very interesting and rich uh, uh, discussion of the issues surrounding prevention or early stages of, uh, of dementia and the sorts of things we might do to try to postpone the uh, beginning of that kind of problem. Um, I've learned a lot from this, but I'm going to uh, go to the uh, questions here to find out um, uh, about the, uh, the sort of issues that have been raised by the audience. And uh, one of them is to do with the fact that you were measuring um, the sleep and physical activity at baseline, uh, and then there's a follow-up over 10 years. And so um, presumably during that time, some people will have changed their sleep patterns, some people will have changed their physical activity pattern. Uh, are those things that you were able to take into account? So yeah, so unfortunately, we're not able to take into account changes in um, sleep duration during the follow-up period, and that's because sleep duration is not measured at all waves. Um, in general, um, sleep duration decreases with age um, or increases and decreases in quality, um, while physical activity levels do decrease with age as well. Um, so probably what the effect of, of that um, not accounting for those changes is, is actually underestimating the magnitude of the effect of, um, of uh, poor sleep and physical inactivity on cognitive function. Um, however, um, so that will be a very interesting uh, sort of direction for future research to examine sort of more trajectories of, of physical activity and sleep and, and how that um, and how those will influence uh, cognitive trajectories uh, rather than just looking at baseline um, at that sort of static measure. Thank you. <laughs> so another question that's come up is the issue of daytime napping, which you did mention. Did you include that in the in the analysis that you carried out? So we did not include napping. We didn't we didn't have that data available. Um, it's certainly an important consideration because napping increases as we age. Um, um, there is some evidence that um, preceding dementia diagnosis, there's more napping that occurs um, and napping also precedes cognitive decline. But once again, that's most likely sort of this effect of, uh, of um, early dementia on napping rather than the other way around. Um, so yeah, so that will be a, a, another interesting thing to take, take into account in, in um, future studies is to um, incorporate napping into, um, into the measure of sleep and, and how that might differ from how that influences sleep quality or, or yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we're jumping around a bit on topics here, but uh, one which has come up is to do with uh, gender differences and whether there were differences between men, these older men and women in these patterns. 
Yeah, so we did um, we did examine um, gender differences in the paper. Um, so there there were broadly very similar. The only thing that was different between men and women was um, that um, long sleep was associated with actually a slightly better cognitive trajectory in in men um, it, or overall in the overall results. Um, it, it wasn't uh, statistically significant, so we, we didn't really talk about it much because it was very very slight. But we saw that in men, but not in women. Um, so it, it raises an interesting question about sort of determinants of long sleep in, in men and women and, and whether that differs. Um, uh, but yeah, so the, so primarily no gender differences, but but that interesting aspect potentially. Thank you. There's a question about machine learning, which I'm not sure is probably appropriate because you didn't uh, include that here. But uh, there was one query about how these cognitive tests work for people who might have uh, problems with their call, for example, people with ADHD. Um, does that sort of rule out those kind of tests, you think? Um, no, I mean, I they're, they're very broadly administered. Um, they're used. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a certainly an interesting consideration um, as to whether various neurodivergence would influence um, cognitive scores on the test. And, um, and I mean, there's a reason that you use them as part of a dementia diagnosis, but not it's not the entire diagnosis, because uh, obviously there are many reasons why you might perform poorly on a test. Um, and, and so that's why the diagnosis includes uh, a lot of a lot of other um, um, a lot of other features. So so you're not just going off a single a single poor cognitive score. OK, thank you. If I could uh, ask a question of my own, I was very intrigued by this difference between objective and subjective speak, um, sleep uh, measures. And uh, you were saying that these two are only moderately correlated. Um, I was just wondering about the nature of that uh, relationship. Is it that people are typically overestimating the quality of their sleep or underestimating the quality of their sleep if you're as a sub subjective experience compared with what you can measure objectively? Yeah, so unfortunately it differs by age and by many different uh, sort of demographic factors. So in general, we see that um, um, we see that older people tend to um, overestimate their sleep quality, whereas younger people, it tends to be a little bit more consistent, but there is very, very sort of moderate agreement between these two measures. It's, 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 it's really sort of, uh, especially, especially sort of the sleep quality aspects, sleep duration, I think is a little bit more reliable, but for the sleep quality aspects, I think it's, um, it, it's, it really is measuring two sort of completely different, <laughs> um, um, uh, constructs. Um, but, but yeah, in general, um, it, it's unfortunately not really predictable how people, whether people will overestimate or underestimate, except that um, in my own work, I've observed that older people tend to, est tend to estimate that their sleep quality is much better. Um, yeah. I see. <clears throat> because I mean, one of the things about the objective measures is they tend to be done just over a few days, typically. Yeah, whereas, this is true, uh, yeah. Someone with subjective maybe thinking about the last year or last month or in general how they sleep, and particularly when you showed us the picture of the poor person having polysomnography, that's going to be a pretty invasive sort of procedure. So exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so to some extent, the objective one is not necessarily um, better in a sense. Um, it, it also has limitations, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's very, very challenging to get a. I think that's why um, accelerometer use in these large population studies is 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 an exciting thing because it's minimally invasive. Um, I, there's teams right now who are sort of working on the um, working on being able to extract more than sort of just sleep duration and basic disturbances from um, these accelerometers. Um, so um, yeah, because of course it's it's difficult to get a normal night's sleep when you're hooked up to all sorts of machines. Um, so yeah, so I think, yeah, definitely the objective measures are not without without fault. Great. Okay, so there's a question that's come in about um, uh, sleep habits and the timing of those and whether there's any evidence about, for example, midlife or younger uh, uh, ages of people's sleep patterns then. Uh, do we know anything about how those might be associated with later life um, cognition? Uh, obviously, this particular study only started at 50, but I guess what was being asked about is uh, younger ages as well. Um, so I'm not so I know that there's a lot of studies that examine sort of sleep um, patterns of sleep and academic performance. Um, and it's sort of what you would expect. Um, um, generally, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure because the issue is there that you need to follow up people over a very, very, very long period of time to be able to 
assess their sleep habits very early in life and then also assess cognitive aging. Um, so I'm not um, aware of studies out there, but certainly there, there might be. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's a, a question about the <clears throat> your physical activity measure, because in this analysis, what you did is you um, essentially divided people out into those people who are sort of the highest group and then yeah. the uh, remainder of the people. How does that kind of translate into physical activity recommendations, also practical um, uh, recommendations? Yeah, so generally it, it points to the importance of weekly vigorous physical activity is really what it came down to. And of, of course that should be supported by, um, by, uh, by moderate physical activity. So by, by participating in, in sort of daily moderate physical activity, but, but, um, but what we saw was really, that was where the divide was, was the people who um, did weekly vigorous physical activity versus those who didn't. Right, okay. Um, and uh, so there's a, another question that has come in about the measure that you used of sleep uh, duration um, and what's being asked is, is are those because you're dividing people out in terms of hours of sleep um, does this mean that the person is kind of consistently unconscious during that time or does that include breaks when people wake up or go to the loo and things like that yeah so this is the um the uh feature of um of subjectively assessed sleep where it's not um it's not really specified so so an individual might um might exclude the times that they spent awake or they might not and it's and it's not possible to really to ascertain from this sort of measure um so once again accelerometers uh in large population studies will be will be an exciting thing right right do you have you you were measuring two cognitive domains in this particular study and you were saying at the end that one needs to look more across other ones as well and I suppose one of the issues that comes up here is what the sort of mechanism might be uh, relating these phenomena such as sleep and physical activity to the cognitive uh, decline and cognitive levels of function. How much do we know about that? That kind of aspect? unfortunately, not much at all. I mean, there's there's um, some thoughts that sleep um, uh, sleep impacts sort of hippocampal function, um, but it's very it's it's yeah it's it's a lot of sort of experimental evidence from um, animal models. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, the mechanism is really not particularly well understood. Um, there is some evidence that sleep uh, and physical activity are both, um, so are both sort of implicated in uh, beta amyloid clearance, but that's a bit being brought into question as well. So, so yeah, so it's really, um, the, the mechanism is, is, is not particularly well parsed. I see. Okay. And just just one more point about um, these sort of sleep measures at uh, older ages. There's quite a lot of people, of course, who are older, maybe taking some sort of sleep medication or, uh, you know, something to help them sleep. Um, did you have any information about that that you could uh, add to the study? So we didn't have that information, um, which is sort of a key thing. Um, and um, yeah, certainly a key limitation of, of our work was that we weren't able to consider um, sleep medication because obviously that will influence sleep duration and influence cognitive function. Um, and also influence whether longer sleep is better quality sleep because it's unclear whether you're getting sort of good quality sleep, even if you're sleeping a lot while you're on sleep, while you're taking sleep medication. Um, so yeah, so once again, that will be, unfortunately that those data were not available to us, but that will be a be an important um, area for, for future research. Thank you. And talking about other things that uh, might be relevant, um, a question has come up about uh, alcohol and about whether the impact of, you know, drinking uh, could be affecting these patterns as well. Um, yeah, so the effective adjustment for alcohol was relatively minor once we took into account all of the other um, things that we adjusted for. Um, I guess if we think about, um, um, we would think more about alcohol affecting sleep rather than sleep affecting alcohol. Um, so, so the direction of the causal arrow sort of suggests a confounder, not, not necessarily a mediator or anything like that. Um, but um, um, so, so yeah, so there wasn't a huge impact of alcohol in our study, but, but it's certainly an interesting question is, is to look at sort of um, how alcohol and sleep interact. Um, again, uh, some other issues that um, I expect you would have liked to take a into account that haven't been <laughs> uh, one of them was um 
family diagnosis of cognitive decline or dementia. And uh, another one was um, uh, HRT, whether hormone replacement therapy, whether that was taken into account uh, for the women. Yeah, unfortunately not. So we did, so everyone who reported uh, dementia diagnosis was excluded. Um, and um, um, however, yeah, the HRT is, is, a, is a good point because uh, yeah, that's associated with cognitive performance. And, um, and that was, yeah, once again, information, unfortunately was not available to us, but, but will, would be very interesting to, to investigate. I think the family history of cognitive decline. Is oh, sorry, family history. Sorry, yeah. I thought you said, yeah. Um, yeah that's interesting, yeah. Um, because obviously some of these people, or a lot of your people are, you know, in the 60s, 70s and 80s and may not necessarily have a, um, a very precise um, information about their parents, for example, in terms of cognition and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I guess, um, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that that's yeah, that's a very interesting question. But but yeah, it would I think it would be very challenging to to examine. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end of the questions on um, Slido, and uh, we're getting to the end of our time anyway. So I'll um, I'll close the session uh, now and um, thank you again for a really interesting uh, presentation and uh, also from the questions from the various uh, uh, people who are listening and that uh, it's great. The, the uh, information, the talk is on YouTube so people can look at this at uh, some later points. Uh, and um, I'd like just to finish by mentioning the next uh, lunch hour lecture, which is taking place on the 3rd of October. And this is about the crisis of British benefits policy how we got here. And this is by Dr. Tom O'Grady. So we're all looking forward to hearing that. Thank you very much, uh, Michaela, and thank you very much uh, to the audience. Thank you.